Father, we come here tonight in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and as we open your word, may you teach us through your Holy Spirit what you have us to know. And may you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Everybody, please silence your phones. <laughs> All right. So we're in Genesis chapter 10. In Genesis chapter 10, we are going to... I better put my glasses on. We're going to see the table of nations from Noah. The first king, Nimrod. We're going to see that man is so stupid he goes back to his prideful actions for the things that God had destroyed the world for before. We will see the beginning of the Babylonian system that is with us to this day. The very name of Babel points to what they were up to. Babel the, is made up of two syllables. Bab equals gate. And L equals God. Gate of God. Something was going on with this. In chapter 11, we'll go into this more in depth. Talking about the Tower of Babel. Now let's uh, read Genesis chapter 10, starting in verse 1, and going down through verse 7. Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japh Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, uh, Tubal, Meshach, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, Ripath, Togarma. The sons of Javan were Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, Dadodim. From these coastlands, peoples of of the Gentiles were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their families, and into their nations. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizram, Put, Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Septa, Rama, Shebekta. The sons of Rama were Sheba and Dedan. Sheba and Dedan, we know them as Saudi Arabia. We see these very familiar names straight out of prophecy. Magog, Togarma, Tubal, Meshach, Gomer, Tarshish, Sheba, Dedan. We've recently studied through the book of Re Revelations. We've uh, studied other prophecies. And a lot of these names come up over and over again. One of them that comes up a lot is Magog and Gog. Gog is a title like Pharaoh. It's the title of a king. And Gog was the king over Magog. In Isaiah 66, 19, we see clues about who Tarshish is. Tarshish is also believed by many to be Britain. And in Isaiah 66, 19, it says, I will set a sign among them and those among them who escape, I will send to the nations, to Tarshish, and Put, and Pull, and Lud, who draw the bow, and Tubal, and Javan, to the coastlands afar off, who have not heard my fame, nor seen my glory. They shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. The clue is, who draw the bow, and declaring God's glory among the Gentiles. You see, from the founding of Britain, it was common that people, in, the men in Britain, were archers. In fact, it was the law for a long time that they had to possess a bow and practice publicly with it on a regular basis. But one other thing you might not, might not know is how many missionaries England sent out over the years. And not just England, but Ireland. Tons and tons of missionaries. See, we think about the Irish Catholics in a way that we shouldn't. The Irish Catholic Church, for a long time, the Roman Catholics did not know what to do with the Irish Catholic Church because when it was established, they actually had the gospel. Now, down through the years, it become, became corrupted over time. But at one point in time, the Irish, Catholic, Irish Church sent missionaries back into England and back into Scotland and they, mission, they were missionaries to the Picts and the Scottish 
and some of these tribes in the Welsh. They were some of the most effective uh, missionaries out there. And not only that, is in Ireland, they maintained education through the Dark Ages. They maintained literacy where all the other parts of Europe didn't. Now that's a, that's a rabbit trail and, and you can study that out for yourself. At one point, <clears throat> let's see. And then in Ezekiel, we get more clues. Ezekiel 27, 12. Tarshish was your merchant speak. Tarshish was your merchant because of your many luxury, luxury goods. They gave you silver, iron, tin, and lead for your goods. And we know to, even to this day, these are <coughs> minerals that are commonly mined in Britain. Ezekiel 27, 13, Javan, Tubal, Meshach are your traders. They bartered human lives and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. Josephus and other ancient writers refers to these peoples as the Scythians. And you know them loosely as the Russians or the Slavic people. Ezekiel 27, 14, those from the house of Tagarma traded for your wares, your horses, your steeds, and your mules. Ezekiel 38, 2. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against him. Ezekiel 39, 1. You and your sons, oh, you, son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Why do I bring all this up? Why do I bring up all this prophecy stuff in relationship to Genesis chapter 10? The reason why I do this is because we're getting ready to see who, Nimrod, the first king that was announced in the Bible. Nimrod is a type of Antichrist. And Antichrist is a type of Nimrod. They can go interchangeably, interchangeably back and forth. And also in Micah, it refers to Nimrod as the Assyrian. And one thing we know about the Antichrist, it talks about the Antichrist being the Assyrian. It's one of his titles. This one gives me chills because Gog is the king of Magog. Rosh refers to Russia. Meshach, some people say is Moscow. Tubal, some people say is Tublinsk. Maybe. You know, this is thousands of years ago. Some of this stuff has come down. But you can study out the languages all you like. The idea is, is the concept behind Nimrod, the concept behind these nations. This is not something that we should lightly pass over. They had just come from the flood. In fact, Noah is still alive. Nimrod could have gone and spoke with Noah. Did this stuff really happen? We don't even have this concept in our mind about the length of time some of these people lived and how other people's lives overlapped who was living. In fact, Shem was probably still alive when Abraham was alive. So think about this. You have these lives overlapping, and maybe they didn't live in the same area, but they could have actually been contemporaries and talked to one another. Hey, you saw this. What happened? What really has gone on? Yet they're already immediately headed away from what God has told them to do, to go and f replenish the earth, to fill the earth, and to spread out across the earth. Yet they're grouping themselves up. Chapter 11 deals a lot more with this, about the fact that they came from the east to the plain of Shinar, and they began to build, a, to build a, a city. But as we read on down here, you'll see that Nimrod was the key factor in this. He, he was the guy that started this whole kingdom, and the idea of building these cities and trying to keep people in and together. <clears throat> Why do we think that we're so much different in the modern age? Think about this. In our modern age, we know what is right and what is wrong. We, no other generation has ever been so replete, so saturated with Bibles and Bible helps and concordances and teachings and all this other stuff. And yet we, became, we become a more twisted culture every single day. 
who are we to say, who are we as a nation to say that a marriage is no longer one man, one woman for life? We have no rights. God established the family from the beginning. God established the nation from the beginning. You weaken the family, you weaken the nation. Strong families build strong nations. Weak families breed the collapse of a nation. Many people don't realize that Rome collapsed under its own weight and its own debauchery. We're headed down the same path Rome did. Where everybody was socially approving sexual immorality. Socially approving of drug use. Socially approving of alternate li lifestyles. You know, there's a new documentary out, What is a Woman? <laughs> Holy cow, I have not seen it, but I've seen excerpts from it. And I am telling you, to go up to a group of women at the Women's March in Washington, D.C., and ask, what is a woman? And the, the ladies in that group stumble over what a woman is, <laughs> is insane. Mm -hmm. nightmare. Our country... Or not only our country, but our world has gone insane. Why? Why has it gone insane? Marty hit on it on Sunday in his sermon in Romans chapter 1. Thinking they are wise, they have become fools and exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. If you guys ever have a why question, Romans is the book to go to about this stuff. It really is. But hold on, because it's going to challenge you. It's going to challenge your beliefs. And one thing we need to remember, when we're studying the Word of God, if we come up against something in the Word of God that we disagree with, we're the ones that are wrong. Okay? The other thing we need to remember in studying the Word of God, and I spoke to a, a lady this week about this, is the fact that just because the Bible reports on stuff doesn't mean the Bible condones stuff. Polygamy, theft, you know, conning your neighbor, all this other debauchery that mankind get into so easily. Just because it's telling you about it doesn't mean it agrees with it. We need to remember these things. Because so easily, we get this candy-coated Christianity in this country. And people go after this stuff because it sounds so good. It tickles the ear. Right? Because there's no cost in it for us. David himself said, Will I worship God if it costs me nothing? Think about this. When was the last time you considered what you were doing in your own lives? What you were doing, what this country was doing? The people you voted for, the people you live next to, the people you do business with, yourself even. You need to take five minutes, slow yourself down long enough, and think about what's going on. We've got so used to a lot of things in our lives that we are not shocked anymore. And it, what comes to my mind in that whole thing is when I was a little kid, they used to have this thing on, I think it was ABC or CBS, called Friday Night at the Movies. And you know, this is pre-cable television. We had two or three channels, you know, rabbit ears, <laughs> right? <clears throat> we were staying with my grandmother. My mom and dad went out to dinner and they left us with my grandma. And the movie True Grit came on. And we're watching that movie and old John Wayne, he didn't even say all the words, he said S-O-B. And my grandmother got up and she was so mad when she shut the TV off, it fell off the little roll away stand she had it on and it busted and then she was mad at the break in the TV. She was mad at what was on the TV. She was mad at us kids seeing it. She was shocked. Shocked that that would be in the presence of children. And we didn't, we never heard language like that before. We didn't know what the big row was about. 
But now we've gone from that until turn on your television, not at night, turn on your television at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and see what's being broadcast across the airwaves. You don't even have to have cable television for this stuff. Just regular NBC, CBS television at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It'll turn your stomach if it wasn't for the fact that we had been desensitized to it. That is what is going on with these people in Babel when Nimrod comes to power. We so easily walk away from it. Think about this. We're only two or three generations away from the greatest generation that fought World War II. And we have forgotten the evil of Nazi Germany and Japan. We have forgotten the evil, uh, evils of communism, of Stalin and Lenin and Mao and the millions. People talk about the six million people that Hitler killed. That compares nothing to Stalin, 60 million. Or Mao, they estimate Mao killed nearly a hundred million of his own people. And why do I bring this up? I bring this up to shock you into realizing where we're at. The very same practices that are being done in our country are being done in our school system with our young is the very same practices Mao and Lenin and Stalin practiced to implement communism. Communism is anti-God. It is the Babylonian system, one of them. Another one of the Babylonian system, you can say, is when the church and state become unified to the point where somebody accuses you in the church, the state tries you and executes you. We saw that come down through the Inquisition. And there's places that we see that being worked out today through Islam. So don't think the Babylonian system is away. The Babylonian system also integrates finances and banking and, and real estate purchases and who can have what job. We're going to get further on into this next week. But the reality is, is we don't even realize. And I'm going to talk to you in just a few minutes about a super innocuous thing that we've all participated in that is total Babylonianism and we didn't even realize it as young children. But let's talk about Nimrod first. Let's go to verse 8. Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Achad, Kalana, in the land of Shinar, from the land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, Kalah, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kalah. That is the principal city. This statement, mighty, he became a Gabor or a Gaborim. What does that mean? In Genesis chapter 6, we talked about this. When it was talking about the giants of the land and the mighty men, in Genesis chapter 6, they were the offspring of the unholy union between fallen angels and women. That was the Gabarim. There's something unnatural going on here with, with Nimrod, and we don't understand. In the British Museum of Natural History in London, there's a relief that they excavated from Nineveh of Nimrod. And Nimrod is holding a full-grown lion as you would hold a small poodle. Now we talked about the fact about giants in Genesis chapter 6. Whether this is political theater, right? Somebody's trying to say, well, look at our king, he's so mighty. Or whether Nimrod was actually that big. You see, a lion can weigh upwards of 400 pounds. Whether it's political theater or actuality, it doesn't matter. The point is, Nimrod is becoming one of these people who is turning his back on God. And not only that, he's establishing a kingdom in which he's turning his back on God. When I was a kid, an insult 
somebody to call you Nimrod, right? It means you were stupid. Well, the birth of that insult comes from the fact that it's just stupid, Nimrod. You're only three generations from the flood and you're going against God again and doing the very things God destroyed the world for. Are you crazy? And the answer to that is yes, he's crazy with his self. He's a true narcissist. And that is something that is replete within our culture is narcissism. Social media feeds narcissism. It used to be said everybody's a narcissist a little bit. And then you have real narcissists. But now I don't think that's the truth. I think everybody's a narcissist when it comes to social media, seeing what the next person's doing and all this other stuff, trying, trying to keep up with the Joneses. Not so much a lot of people in here in this generation. But don't be surprised about the younger generation because that's their culture. If I wanted to meet a girl when I was in high school, I'd go to A&W in Payette. <laughs> okay? But, the real, but now, they do all this stuff online. It's who said, he said, she said, all this other stuff. No wonder they're crazy. No wonder there's school shootings. And we have allowed this to happen. At some point in time, we have to pump the brakes. At some point in time, we have to say, Look, we don't allow children to drink alcohol. Why are we going to allow them to poison their minds with stuff like this? Because in reality, it's pornography. Because it leads them away from Christ. It leads them away from healthy relationships. You know, when I employ young people in my business, and one of the number one problems I have with employing young people is they can't finish a complete sentence. I am not joking. I wish this wasn't true. But I'll be out, I'll be trying to get some work done, and I call the, call the individual on the phone and I say, okay, what are you doing? Describe to me what's going on. And I got three or four words, and they can't fit complete sentences together. It's not that they're not intelligent, it's that's not their syntax. That's not how they communicate. They communicate in sound bites. Don't be shocked that they haven't read the Bible. Don't be shocked they haven't read some of the stuff you've read. And there's never been a greater divide between generations than there is right now. It's the truth. So why is this all dire? All this stuff sounds dire and everything, but I believe the Spirit of God can overcome all of this. And God's going to do whatever it takes to overcome this. Back to Nimrod. He was becoming a Gabarim, or a Gabor, a mighty one in the earth. Gabor is Hebrew. Gabarim means multiple. Uh, but it means mighty man. You would think of somebody like a... Uh, like a Achilles or Hercules, some of these, these mythic heroes from Greek mythology. That's who would you think about? The demigods. That's what the idea is that's being conveyed. In Micah chapter 5, verse 6, it says, They shall waste with a sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. Thus he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into the, our land and when he treads within our borders. In this verse, we're seeing the association of Nimrod with the title of the Assyrian. Remember what I told you about the fact that Nimrod was synonymous or, or is a type of Antichrist? This is a, one, of the, one of the supporting verses for that. Okay? There's more. And if you want to follow this out for yourself, and if you're taking notes, here are the other verses. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 24. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 25. Isaiah chapter 19, verse 23. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 4. Hosea chapter 11, verse 5. And Micah chapter 5, verse 5.
And then we come back to the whole thing about his city, Babel. See, Babel becomes Babylon eventually. And we know about the Tower of Babylon, which will be talked about in chapter 11. They're building a tower to God. Why? What is the purpose of these people building this tower to God? That's right. They're trying to take over. In Psalms, it talks about why didn't the nations rage and plant, plot a vain thing? You know, at the end of days, humankind is going to be so deceived that they're going to think they can make war with God. Now think about this. You have got to be crazy as a long-tailed cat in a rocking chair factory to think that you're going to make war with God. He created the entire universe. He could snuff you out in a heartbeat. And you're going to take a tank or an airplane or a missile or a laser and come against God? What sense does this make? It doesn't. Thinking they're wise, they have become fools. The other part about that in Romans chapter 1, it talks about the fact that they knew God, but they chose not to uh, worship Him as God, but made idols of mankind, four-footed animals, and creeping things. You notice how it progresses downward? We always talk about how we're becoming modern, we're becoming more intellectual, we're becoming smarter than our predecessors. But anything that history would ever teach us is the fact that the farther we go down in history, the more corrupt mankind becomes. Now I told you I was going to tell you about a Babylonian ceremony that we've all participated in and that you might not be aware of. Has anybody in here ever been on an Easter egg hunt? Did you ever wonder what Easter eggs and rabbits have to do with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? So let me tell you. Now, you're not going to find this in the Bible. This is extra biblical. Okay? But Nimrod had a wife, and her name was Simiramis. But because Simiramis was a prostitute, he had to postulate that she had perpetual virginity. Because the people in his kingdom would not accept her as their queen if she was a prostitute. So he brings her into his castle, into his, into his uh, palace, whatever you want to call it. Makes her his queen. And then, of course, you can imagine the, the blow up and the gossip and all the stuff around her. And then, I don't remember exactly, but I think Nimrod dies or Nimrod isn't around and she gets pregnant somehow. Imagine that. We don't even know what a woman is. Okay? So Simiramis gets pregnant when Nimrod's not around. And her explanation of this when Tammuz, her son, was born, is that she went down to the river Euphrates and a rabbit come up to her with an egg and out popped Tammuz. Now, I'm not going to tell you the rest of the story, because it gets really twisted from here. <laughs> okay. Not even close. Okay. But you might know these by different names. Zeus, Aphrodite, Apollo. And then you go into every culture, you have these same deities possessing the same attributes, just with different names. That's Babylonianism. And the idea of us celebrating Easter, we don't celebrate Easter as Christians. We should celebrate Resurrection Sunday or the Feast of First Fruits. But Easter is a day to celebrate the birth of Tammuz who came to, to Simiramis. But Simiramis is also known by another name in the, in the Mideast, and that's Esther, I mean, Astartes. Okay? And I can't pronounce all these names, but basically it boils down to Easter. Okay? 
you can go through culture and culture. And each name, they kind of change a little bit. So Easter was the celebration of the birth of Tammuz. But really, Easter is the celebration, I mean, what we would consider to be Easter, we should be celebrating the Feast of First Fruits. The resurrection of the first one, Jesus Christ. That is what it's from. See, you didn't even know you were a pagan. <laughs> um, Next you're going to say there's something associated with Christmas, too. Well, we're not going to. I don't want to ruin all of them in one day, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you want to. Well, I've lost control. <laughs> If you want to see more about this, read in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 18, and Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 18. You'll find out a little bit more about this. Here's something else. Did you know in today that in the Jewish culture, the Hasidic Jews still practice this, in, which is spoken of in Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 18? They still weep and cry for the Queen of Heaven and bake cakes for her son. Hasidic, Hasidic Judaism practices this pagan rite that's spoken of in Jeremiah chapter 44. Today. That's what that big riot was last year. is because somebody challenged them on it. Somebody challenged them that you're practicing paganism, you're practicing Babylonianism. But here's one of those things where Christ said, you forsake the scriptures for man's traditions. Think about that. Do we do the same? Do we forsake the word of God for the traditions of men? And we're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. The point is, is for... Growing up in this country, it was synonymous with being an American. You were a Christian, you were a red-blooded American, and Christianity and American citizenship went hand in hand. To the point that, uh, that your patriotism almost became idolatry. I really had to check myself in this. Because I joined the military as a patriot. I joined the military and went, went to the service as a patriot. And many did. But when, I, when that becomes paramount over God and God's word, that's idolatry. Now, I'm not speaking against this country. What I am saying, because we're also told in the New Testament that we're to honor the king. We are. We're to do our duty for our country. There's nothing wrong with that. But remember the order of things that God has set forth. God first, your family, then your country. That is the order of things. And we actually just saw that here in this chapter. It's talking about the fan. First, he created man, then he created the family, then he created the nations. But who created man? It was God. Verse 13. And we're going to go through this table of nations, and I'm probably going to finish early. But Mizram begot Ludim, Anamim, Lahibim, Neftu, oh boy, Im, <laughs> Parathizim, Kasulim, came, whom came the Philistines at Kephorim. Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Gergesites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, and the Arvites, and the Sh Shimerites, and the Ham Hamathites. Afterward, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed. And the border of the Canaanites was from S Sidon, as you go towards Gir, as far as Gaza. Then as you go towards Sodom and Gomorrah, Adam, Adama, and Zeboim, as far as Laish. These were the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, in the land 
lands and in their nations. And the children were born also to Shem, the, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth and the elder. The son of Shem were Elam, Ashur, Arphaxed, Lud, Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Our facts had begot Selah, Selah begot Eber, Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his day the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan begot Almadad, Selah, Hazmarebeth, Jerah, Hadorim, Uzel, Dikla, Obal, Abalim, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Joab. All these were the sons of Joktan, and their dwelling place was from Mesha, Mesha as you go towards Safar, the mountains of the east. These were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, according to their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah according to their generations in the nations and from these nations were divided on the earth after the flood. Let's go back to Peleg. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in the days, in his days, the earth was divided. All right. There is mountains of volumes written upon the earth was divided in his days. You can say, that's when the Tower of Babel happened. And God gave everybody a different language. You can say, at this point in time, the continents drift, drifted apart after the flood. I don't know. I just know that the lands were divided. Okay? Either way, it serves God's purpose. What was God's purpose? When they came off the they came off the ark. God's purpose was that they would spread out across the earth and populate the earth. We don't need to go much deeper into it than that. Really. God's going to get His will done whether we want it or not. Whether we're so self-important we think we can stop God's will, God will go around us, God will go through us, God will go over us, to get his will done. The best thing to remember is that God wants you to participate with him in his will. And if you've ever been involved in something where you knew God was in it, and you were helping God accomplish the will, his will, it's like being on a roller coaster ride. It's enjoyable, it's fun. I mean, I know some people don't enjoy, enjoy roller coasters, but the deal is, hang on because it's gonna be a ride. Right? And if you've ever done it, you'll, you'll find out that it's very, very enjoyable and fulfilling to do God's will. When I, came, when I was going to come to Christ, when I was, before I became a believer, I thought that, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to become a Christian. It's going to kill all my fun. I'm not going to have any more fun after that. It's not going to be exciting. We're going to all sit around and stare at one another and do Bible studies. <laughs> Right? But the truth is, since I've come to Christ, it has been exciting. There have been tons of times it has really been fulfilling working in God's will. But the trick is, the absolute trick is keeping yourself in God's will and not getting out in front of it. When it becomes about you, it's no longer about God. You have to submit yourself to what God has planned. And if it disagrees with your sensibilities, you're wrong. And you're the one that needs to change. Not God. Not God's word. Don't redefine something as the world does today. They redefined us right out of women in America. That makes no sense. In John 14, 15, it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And in John 5, 43, it says, I have come in my Father's name, 
and you do not receive me. If another one comes in his own name, him you will receive. Who is Christ speaking about there? He's speaking about the Antichrist. Just as Noah was still alive when Nimrod became king, the very idea that Nimrod became king is a usurpation of Noah's authority. Nimrod was seizing authority from Noah, his grandfather, his predecessor, by declaring himself to be king before Noah was dead. That in itself, at the heart, shows you the willful nature, the prideful nature of Nimrod. And this right here shows our prideful nature that somebody's going to come along and he's going to be dynamic. He's going to be a great speaker. He's going to be kind. He's going to be the guy that rises to power through peace. He's going to look like the most peaceful guy. They're going to call him the Messiah because he's going to be the prince of peace to this world. But he's going to be a lamb that speaks as a lion. And he's going to turn on everybody that follows him and he is going to destroy them. That is the Antichrist. How often do we follow cults of personality in this country? We need to guard ourselves against that. You see, in the New Testament, Christ speaking about the end times in both, John, both Matthew 24 and Luke 21, he says, Be not deceived. If Christ told you, be not deceived, that means he's given you the ability to not be deceived. What does that require of us? That requires study of his word, time alone with him in prayer, spending time with other fellow believers in fellowship. How do you hear the word of God? How do you hear God speaking to you? Through study, through prayer, through other believers. That is why it's so critical that we do not forsake the gathering together of one another as is common with some. Everybody in here understands that it is inconvenient at times to come to church or to come to Bible study. Everybody gets that. But like I said earlier, what did David say? Shall I worship God if it costs me nothing? That's the real question. That is the real question. And let's go to something extra biblical. Anything worth having will require effort. Will require work. Anything. Everything that I have ever had in my life required some effort behind it. But we are extending to you and God is extending to you the most valuable thing you could ever have. And that's eternal life. Sanctification through Jesus Christ and His Holy Spirit. That's what's being offered to you. Fellowship with other believers. Sharing in their lives. I told my wife not long ago, I find it strange that I am closer with the people I go to church with than I am with my own brothers. You know, we need to remember this, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ in here. We need to have grace for each other. And we also need to be willing to say, hey, you got to watch out for that. That might sound nice. We might be saving somebody's feelings. But I'm telling you this. Don't save somebody's feelings to the point they go to hell. Hell is a real place. People will go there. And if you're trying to be nice to somebody, you're not being nice to them if you don't tell them the truth. And that is the truth. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this evening. Father, we just hope that you would work on the hearts of all of us to do your will. I know that there's a lot of people here that want to do your will. I just pray for clarity. I pray that you would just make it clear to them what they should be doing to serve you and to serve their brothers and sisters. 
Father, teach us to grow right where you've planted us and to be satisfied with what you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.